May I now request Mr. S. Nanda, Director Operations, Hindustan Copper Limited, to deliver his keynote address and presentation. Shri S. Nanda is Director Operations at Hindustan Copper Limited since May 2013. Shri S. Nanda is B.Tech from IIT Kanpur, MS Engineering, MSc Engineering. Shri Nanda had worked in various capacities in LNT at their iron and steel foundry from 1977 to 1986. He joined NALCO in 86 when the company was in its commissioning stage. In NALCO, Shri Nanda held key managerial positions in smelters, operations, projects, and R&D functions. Before, before joining HCL, Shri Nanda was general manager projects at Nalco Smelter Division. Please welcome Mr. Nanda with a big round applause. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. <coughs> Esteemed dignitaries on the dais, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I must really compliment the organizers for excellent arrangements. I'm also really grateful to them for having given me an opportunity to actually share my views on, on a subject which is in fact very close to my heart, that is growth opportunities and concerns of the corporate industry. I'm a strong believer of the fact that all issues concerning the industry somehow directly or, or indirectly are related to really supply and demand. More so, considering the fact that all local prices are determined by the prices prevailing at the LME, it would be appropriate to start from the global perspective. Let's have a look at the year that just went by. The mini mining boom still really continues despite hiccups in various expansion sites. As a result, the production from the mines has gone up by about 1.3%. On the other hand, the demand in China for the first time since 1998 has registered a number which is less than 7.5 percent. Actually, it's uh, the increase over last year has been of the order of about really 4.9 percent. As a result of all this, we expect some supply surplus for this year. And the world at large is looking at India for some upsurge in demand. Let's say the India story. We would normally expect, if all goes well, increased demand for copper to come from growth in the energy sector, in the railway sector, and growth of GDP and urbanization. Let me explain why and how. As per International Energy Agency estimates, power production in India is set to rise by 15 to 20 percent annually. Add to this the 12th five-year plan target of 88,000 megawatt capacity addition, both these added together is set to increase consumption from the energy sector by at least about two times. Interestingly, renewable energy sector, which is also a focus area of this government, also would attract a fair amount of copper. As you would see, Compared to the thermal power, wind, nuclear and solar would, would absorb more copper than, than the normal really traditional mode, that's about 2, 2.5 and 6.8 metric, metric tons per megawatt. This I think should be music to the ears of the industry. Next sector which is likely to grow is the, is the railway sector. It's obvious that railways in fact 
copper would find application in electrification and where it finds application is by way of connectivity between overhead lines and the locals. Aggressive electrification is underway. We've covered only about really 23 odd thousand kilometers against a target of about 64,000. Urban, Urban Development Ministry aims at adding really metro rail in 12 tier 2 cities. They, there exists immense potential for exports in railway electrification projects overseas. LNT is, is, is in fact receiving orders. Another focus area would be the high speed trains. Interestingly, the maximum speed that a train can take is limited by the strength and the conductivity of these, of these trolley wires and, and contact wires, which means that virgin copper will not do. We'll have to resort to alloys of copper, essentially copper magnesium and copper silver. In, and there are no producers of copper magnesium and copper silver in India now. And, an area of opportunity there. Well, Barclays Capital had, had, had actually conducted an interesting study in which they observed that there are interestingly two thresholds to be exceeded in case if you expect a surge in copper demand. One would be the state of urbanization or the extent of, extent of urbanization and the per capita income. China, suddenly there was a surge in copper demand when the urbanization touched 30% and the per capita income touched about $5,000 or so. India is very near that today. The urbanization has exceeded 30% and in 2015 we expect the per capita income to hover around really $2,000 per ton. So it won't be long before we reach that stage. What happens then? Well, when urbanization and, and GDP grows, the demand would come in the form of sheets, foils, tubes, profiles in, 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 in actual white goods, in buildings, in construction and all that. But it would be, it would be uh, at this stage of time, it would be uh, essential that we do have a look at what is the state of this fabrication market. The market is fairly really fragmented. There are very few players. Copper being an expensive metal, the working capital requirement is high. As, as a result, there is limited infusion of modern technology. No wonder we continue to import sheets wider than 450 mm. We do not produce foils which are less than 45 microns. We do not produce any really tubes more than really 50 feet. And you, I, I was just really checking, in 2013-14, the imports of fabricated products were to the extent of 900 metric tons of profiles, 12,000 metric tons of tubes, 6,500 metric tons of foils, and 5,000 5, metric tons of sheets. Immense growth potential there. But well, what really worries me is that there has been a fairly limited growth in the applications of copper. If you compare it with uh, the aluminum industry, the growth in uh, applications has been minimal. The reasons are not very difficult to find. Copper has a very interesting story. In the sense, there are three distinct sectors, mining, smelting and actual fabrication. And the mining sector, copper is available in relatively less affluent countries who prefer to mine, beneficiate and export. And the relatively more affluent countries import this and smelt it. The smelting sector still remains really a separate sector and fabrication sector is an entirely different sector. Compare that with aluminium. In the case of in the case of aluminium, primary aluminium producers like Alcoa, Hindalco, Nord Hydro deal with all of these these sectors at the same time, which means they have 
uh, well, as somebody remarked, you must have noticed that aluminium, who would have imagined about really 15, 15, 20 years earlier that aluminium would be all set to replace steel in a big way in the automotive sector? Extensive effort and R&D has actually gone into this. That kind of effort, R&D and investment is just not there in copper today. However, there has been some work all right. Certain areas that copper has invested is in energy efficient motors, antimicrobial surfaces, ultra, ultra conductive copper and micro alloyed copper for overhead line conductors. Let me explain. Well, motors and motor driven systems are used in 46% of total usage. Using up, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a small mistake here. Using up 69% of global electricity consumption. Thus, energy efficiency of motors are very, very important. It's been seen that replacement of aluminium by copper die cast rotors improves efficiency to the order of 1 to nearly 5%. And how does it do it? Well, all along, aluminium die cast rotors were being used just because of the fact that copper die cast rotors could not be produced. Copper die cast rotors couldn't be produced because of the fact that the die steels which were, which were used to make these uh, uh, rotors were, were not up to the mark. By introduction of nickel based steels and heating of the dies, die cast copper rotors have been a reality. This has brought down the electrical losses to a very large extent. And in conjunction with certain more efficiency norms, it's been said that if all countries adopt these kind of efficiency norms, it is estimated to save some 322 million megawatt annually, a whopping amount that, and 206 million tons of CO2 emissions. This, I think, is a fair amount of opportunity for the industry. Incidentally, Siemens has already come up with energy efficient motors in the range of 1 to about 100 kilowatt. SCW is also really, really following behind. Antimicrobial surfaces. India has known that drinking water from the copper vessels is supposed to be good for health. Well, hospital, some studies have indicated that hospital acquired infections kill 100,000 people annually. And about $45 million is spent in, in, in actually treating infections such as E. coli, influenza, etc. It's, it has also been seen that copper based surfaces enable killing 99.9% .9 bacteria in less than 2 hours. What an opportunity that. How it does is that copper releases ions which, which actually enters the cell walls of microbes stopping their functioning and their reproduction. This I think would, would present an immense opportunity in the coming days. Carbon nanotubes introduced inside copper is supposed to increase ambient temperature conductivity by 30%. This would find interesting applications. Another very interesting application we just came across was micro alloyed copper conductors. This would provide an alternative to ACSR for high voltage overhead lines. I am sure all of you must be aware what ACSR is. ACSR is aluminum conductors steel reinforced. The transmission lines have been really traditionally uh, have been traditionally using ACSR, that's aluminum conductor steel reinforced or aluminum alloy, aluminum all alloy conductor AAAC. Now, uh, these require steel reinforcement. Copper being strong enough, heavy enough, you do not need any steel reinforcement. No steel steel reinforcement means no no skin effects, no real corona effects. If there are no skin effects and the and the cross section is less. The wind and ice load would definitely reduce. If wind and ice load would reduce the reinforcement in the in the if transmission hours would reduce. This would be particularly suitable for cold and windy climates. But another interesting thing is also like coming up with um, increasing uh, increasing generation from wind sector wind sector which which produces uh, or or we generates during particular periods of the year, 
there are times when the wind sector generates there are uh, kind of uh, temporary uh, increases in load on the grid and when there's a sudden increase in increase on the uh, on i mean and there is there is sudden overloading of the grid the temperature goes up aluminum uh, uh, transmission lines are designed are designed to take an overload uh, to take a temperature uh, less than 80 degrees micro alloyed copper you can go up to uh, temperature ranges of about really 150 degrees which means it can take overloads much better plus even when we have grid failures then also there are occasions when there would be overloading because uh, suddenly something in fact starts and all that so these kind of overloading can be very comfortably taken by by in fact micro alloy copper conductors in fact life cycle studies indicate that uh, apart from that apart from this uh, because of because of the fact that the that, that the resistivity is much less the transmission losses are less uh, life cycle studies indicate that uh, uh, in about in about really 5 years time you actually recover the cost and this this is going to be an important area of growth in the in the coming years Having spoken about demand, I think it's, it is also necessary to speak about the supply. In India, we have we have Indalco, Sterlite, and, and Hindustan Copper as primary producers. Indalco and Sterlite have capacities of five lakh and four lakh tons each, and uh, uh, they do not have mines. They import really concentrates. They have to depend on volumes. Uh, they have adopted energy efficient. Uh, technologies, modern technologies, and they've been able to uh, extract value out of, uh, see, uh, all the copper ores are lean, nature has uh, still been, been in fact, kind enough to ensure that they are, uh, they, uh, copper ores have really, cop have uh, gold, silver, and, and other valuable items as well. So, uh, so, in, so, Inalco and Sterlite have been extracting silver, gold, selenium tellurium out of it and also the sulfurous gases which e emanate from the smelters are converted to acid and subsequently <coughs> subsequently fertilizers as well hindustan copper let's see what is the kind of strategy that they adopt uh, the maximum value addition has been from the ore to the concentrate so they have they have are now embarking on an ambition expansion program to uh, to raise the capacity from 3.4 to really 12.5 million tons but uh, with the growth in mines you need to commensurate that with with growth in actually smelting or or metal conversion as such but well uh, the entire capacity of mining would generate about really about really 1 lakh tons of copper only and the minimum economy size of a smelter using really traditional methods would be about really 3 to 4 lakh tons and a, and, and the kind of really rule of thumb existing is that for a traditional smelter a 1 lakh ton capacity would require really 2000 tons 2000 crores that means a 4 lakh ton capacity would would require about 8000 crores plus because we would fall short of uh, i mean concentrate we would have to import concentrate which means opex is going to be high high the capex is going to be high it's going to be difficult to operate so uh, uh, we are exploring the possibility of an alternative hydrometallurgical route whereby uh, the capex and opex are very attractive the manpower requirement is one third land requirement is one third there are no oils to be used and there is there is provision of recovery of gold and silver also just what the doctor ordered we are also looking to the possibility um, uh, in the in the ores that are available in um, in jharkhand there is a, there is there is a, a fair amount of nickel uh, we uh, with the expansion at um, at jharkhand we hope to be in a position to uh, extract about 150 tons of nickel incidentally india imports about 40000 tons of nickel per year and we are not producing one single kilogram as of yet molybdenum also we uh, have about really 0.4 to 0.5 percent or so we are we are exploring the possibility of extracting 800 million and 800 800 metric tons of molly the existing price of molly is about 17,500 rupees per ton 17,500 dollars per ton well <clears throat> as, as i said the ores are lean which means 99 percent is waste 
whether there exists scope to recover something from this once this waste is important otherwise this waste is going to occupy a lot of area we are going to use large tracts of land we also are going to use lots of really water to like to transport it uh, some 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 possible solutions could be to kind of um, use high concentration slurry or we can extract valuable metals and materials out of it and also recover the water interestingly there's a there's a mine in australia by glencore which when they expanded uh, uh, expanded the mine they have spent 600 million dollars which includes 60 million dollars for extraction of magnetite out of it and gray they are an iron ore producer they they produce 90000 tons of copper 110000 ounces of gold and 1.2 million tons of iron and uh, 1.2 million tons ton, tons of real magnetite which gets exported to real southeast asia we are also thinking along the same lines uh, we have identified a technology we expect plant to be ready by the year end recycling is another area which i would also also like to speak about Recycling saves about 85 to 90 percent by way of energy costs. In Europe, around 41 percent of copper copper comes from recycling. In China, around 35 percent comes from recycling. In India, we don't have any exact figures. The entire process of collection, sorting, dismantling, and processing is not organized in the country. It is an informal sector mostly. There's another interesting kind of scrap that is e-waste, which is uh, W-E-E-E, -E -E. there's, a, there's a small mistake here, the waste electrical and electronic equipments. They contain plastic, valuable metals and hazardous metals. To illustrate, every million cell phones contain 16 tons of copper, 350, 350 kilograms of silver, 34 kilograms of gold, and 15 kilograms of palladium. I just checked uh, the, the other day, 95 crores of mobile are sold in India, were sold in India in 2014. What, what possibility is here? Uh, you would obviously ask as to really why HCL is interested in this. We have uh, acquired Jagadia Copper Limited of late. It's a, it's a 50,000 million, a 50,000 metric ton refined copper plant in Gujarat, which is based on recycling. We are looking for organized sources of electrical waste to start with. And in about really 12 to 18 months, we would be in a state to produce, to process e-waste for recovery of all of these kind of metals as well. Well, the, it would also be, be important to uh, examine the status of e-waste e in India. E-waste act, uh, uh, e act of 2011, which has been effective from, from 2012, defines e-waste as any equipment that uses electricity or electromotive force to, start, to operate. And Indian industries are mandated to dispose e-waste responsibly. What happens actually is most industries are not aware. Whoever are aware are only applying this to IT equipments and electrical waste like motors and cables are disposed in the normal manner, which means they generate a lot of environmental waste. Where did we go wrong? Where we essentially went wrong is that we do not have, have a tangible EPR, that's an extended producer responsibility. Abroad, they have an extended producer responsibility in the sense that the producer or manufacturer is responsible for the product from the birth to the death. Uh, the, uh, the producers and manufacturers do not provide adequate information on their websites as to who is the collector, where it is available, where collection sites are available, nothing. And, and uh, for a huge geography like India, there aren't enough enough really collection centers as well. What are the recommendations? The State Pollution Control Board has to be vigilant. Otherwise, high-end recyclers cannot operate since the informal sector will always offer real higher rates. There's a requirement of policies to arrest leakages in system, and the companies must maintain a proper inventory of all electronic, electrical items, and e-waste that they dispose. Conclude, I'm just reminded of a line from His, his Holiness Dalai Lama. He said that, well, when we speak, we kind of repeat what we know. And when we listen, we, there are possibilities that we may know something that we do not know. 
I think I must pay really heed to his advice. I may please be excused. And uh, thank you for the thank you to the organizers for giving me an opportunity to I could share my views. And, and I'm sure this deliberations would would throw a lot of insight into the growth of the industry as a whole. Thank you again.